Yeah. Is Sean not coming? Yeah. Yeah. Go be here in a few minutes. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Just making sure. If not, you're going to have to come to the challenge course with us, Pat. <laughs> we need 10 people. <laughs> but where you're. It's probably a good thing if I didn't go because it'll ruin your dynamic of the class. You're part of the class team. Though. You'll be like, no, we're doing it this way. I'll probably just be there for more support. We <laughs> bust out a scale. All right, test like, tomorrow. If you, if Start you today, 30. <laughs> What? It will be over primarily chapter 10. Chapter 5, we kind of introduced a bunch of stuff out of 10, so there's going to be a little bit of 5 in it also. If you remember on 5, we just focused on the visualization techniques, going from pictorial views to orthographic. Remember that worksheet I gave you? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to get some stuff like that to see if you can move from a pictorial view to an orthographic view and identify surfaces and planes. Primarily, the test is performance-based. It's going to be two parts. There is an academic section as well as a performance-based section. The performance-based will all be manual, no computer. So in essence, in the performance-based, it's going to be two areas. One, you're going to start with a pictorial view and have to identify on an orthographic view where those planes and stuff are. It's going to be very similar in Chapter 5, at the end of it, I handed out a worksheet on that. And I just want to make sure that you see this. Remember, do I... This page here? Yeah. Oh, I love that. What page is that? It's like fine model. The end of chapter five. But that's really the first step of visualization is going from a 3D to a 2D environment. Are all the planes, are they all going to have answers? Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, there is going to be another performance-based part that comes out of Chapter 10. In essence, I think what's probably the closest to an example of what it will be would be at the end of Chapter 10. We had a series of assignments that was like this, where you were given two completed views and you needed to project a third view. There will be some of these. In fact, there will be two of them, to be exact. You will be given two completed views. You will not add anything to the two views I give you. They are right. <laughs> you need to project for the third view. Okay, so that's what you I think the best thing to study for that is just go through some of these figures, like we did on G3 and G4 drawings. In essence, that's going to be your performance-based section. Can you project? Now, after that, there is going to be the academic portion where we test on just your terminology, knowledge, and how things work. And this will be done in a multiple choice environment. It will focus on the principles of orthographic projection. And I think we hit these most lectures every morning. I started by grabbing a row and asking some specific questions about orthographic projection and the definitions that went with it. It's going to be that type of stuff. Like the rules you mean? Um, not really necessarily the eight rules of orthographic projection, if that's what you're meaning, Amy. Yeah. Because I think I'll get that knowledge, whether you know that, from the performance-based section. Okay, what I'm talking about more here is when we do orthographic projection, in essence, we put an imaginary glass cube around our object, right? 
called the glass box. And then knowing that in pictorial, I would define my location if I was to draw it in a pictorial sense. If I'm in an orthographic sense, I'm at infinity, therefore my rays of projection are parallel. They are perpendicular to my plane of projection. Therefore, the object mostly appears true size and shape. Any of those terms need to find? We know what a plane of projection is. We know what a glass box is. You know what a, all the components of it. A fold line. What is that? Where you sit in the process. You're at infinity, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as far as the glass box go, we are, goes on page 499. We're going to break this down. And I'm going to ask you some questions about it. And primarily, I think the thing that throws most people is they learn the glass box is to understand that in an orthographic view, all objects are three-dimensional. But we have to display them two-dimensionally in multiple views. And we do this through three planes of projection. Don't confuse these three planes of projection with your three dimensions, because they're different things. What are our three dimensions? Um, Plank width, height, 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 dimensions are displayed from those three planes of projection. You should also know the views created by these three planes of projection. The horizontal creates two views, right? Top and bottom. Frontal does two views, front and back. The profile does right and left. And then the dimensions that go with those views. Any questions on that? It's all kind of shown right here where we have our fold lines, we have our front, H, P, right, for all the different projection planes. Donuts. 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 Fine, I'll buy the damn donuts. <laughs> <laughs> know the difference between a related view and an adjacent view? As far as the three planes that you will see on any object, Know the definitions of a normal plane, an inclined plane, an oblique plane? <clears throat> I think that covers most of the process of orthographic projection. Are you going to have us like identify or Define like the edge, the face, the vertex. Um, no, I won't specifically ask. You know, like because we went over that in chapter five, where we did vertices, mm -hmm. edges. You now, edge is the intersection of two planes. Um, vertice is an intersection of three or more planes, and, and those types of things. No, I, I don't think I'm going to ask you on that. You know, I, I think that's part of your performance-based section when you're projecting that other view. Okay. What about the spot base through hole kind of four? That was going to be my last little portion here. Good segue into the Lisa. Mm -hmm. After we talked about the <clears throat> mathematical theories that we use to create orthographic views, then we went over some of our individual shapes and how they project. And certainly our circles were the main focus on that because we have negative cylinders and positive cylinders. We spent quite a bit of time on negative cylinders because we had a lot of specialty holes for mating objects. And I think you just mentioned the seaboard, the sea sink, and the spot face. Yeah, I, I think those three are things you're going to see time and time again, and I would not be at all surprised to see that on the test, as well as the other things that went with it. What is our tangent convention for cylinders? Yeah. Okay. So we have a curved surface that comes in to a linear surface at a tangent location. We do not project that. Any other thing we do project. Um, we had 
fillets and rounds and how to project them. And when we look at them straight on, we project them as if they were not there. We let the profile view define the shape of a round or a fillet. When we have fillets coming into cylinders, they create a special device. Do you remember what that was called? When you have a fillet coming into a cylindrical surface, it creates a special type of fillet. Yeah. What you do when you go visit your little Halloween horror house, you get scared, you want to run out. How do you actually draw them out? <laughs> yeah. Strapping oh humor. My God. <laughs> the finest portion. Sorry, Lisa, go ahead. How do you actually draw them? You draw one, there's a figure on there. You start at the point of tangency and you draw a 45 degree arc equal to the radius. Okay. And there is a diagram on that that is on page 530. Yeah, I saw that. I was wondering if there's some other. <laughs> yeah. hmm. Following that, we had some conventions. We went over quite in quite a lot of detail, let me just go to the page and give you the page number. Um, 526. Remember this one that the author had that was incorrect? And we spent quite a bit of time talking about cylinders so you can predict how they occur. Mm -hmm. If you're looking parallel to the long axis of any cylinder, it always projects as a circle. If you look perpendicular to the long axis and the cut is 45, it's a circle. All other cases, cylinders will project as ellipses. So we spent quite a bit of time on this and the page next to it, which we already talked about. Are there any questions on any of these? Oh. <laughs> Keep in mind, we have more holes than just the counterbore, spot face, and countersink. We also have through holes, blind holes. I will not ask you any threaded information. We haven't covered it yet. Um, starting on page 533, we had some conventions. Remember these where we have positive shapes, cylinders coming into cylinders, prisms coming into cylinders. We use the 25% rule here on size, on whether we project it or don't project it. And then the next page is the exact same thing with negative shapes. Then we ended the chapter yesterday talking about some conventions. Where we started with the partial convention. What? what before I jump into these, what, what is a convention? Remember that from drafting 131? We had standards and conventions. Conventions are for your discretion. Well, no, not really. Not your discretion. Well, <laughs> the industry's industry discretion industry's would be. Okay, a standard's are a set rule yeah. that we follow. A convention is a deviation from those rules to aid in clarity. That's why we do it. So we had these three conventions at the end to aid in clarity. We had the partial, the revolved, and the removed conventions. Wait, can you repeat that? The partial, mm -hmm. the revolved, and the removed. No, not necessarily. Um, the revolve, the partial, is done if it doesn't give any new information, like with this example here. So this, this object's symmetrical on the other side. We're not giving them anything new by showing this side. So, so we're not going to completely show it. Now, this one's symmetrical. But we also may do it like on page 544, figure 10.84, where we're trying to aid in clarity, this top one. Um, okay. 
It's not symmetrical, but the projection, the true projection, is extremely misleading. So therefore, we don't show the entire object. Okay. You, the, wouldn't you add one or bring it down? Yeah. So right now, we would be real tempted to give a front and a right view and say, I've done my job. These allow us to go the extra step and say, no, I'm going to give them the right of just that one arm, and then I'll go left and give them that arm because it is very clear, and we won't have mistakes down the road. When you do that, do you include the right view? I mean, as is, when you do the partial light up? Do you, do you no, you draw all you of these views as if there was no other view out there. Okay, so you're making a call for each individual view. So technically, when you come and do this, so if you decide, oh, I'm going to do this here, okay, then yeah, you're kind of telling them, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do this here also with it. Because I have to. I have to describe that geometry. That's what we do. You don't give them the other view to show that. But if I go pull a top view, I'm not going to use any partial on the top. I'm going to draw it irregardless of what I've got going in any other view. The top view would be a completed object. Which we would have to give a top if I had another hole in here or something, right? I'd have to go to the top view. And I wouldn't partial it. The revolve doesn't have to be symmetrical. It's generally about a center where the projection gives a false sense of distance. Because all these, like in this example, all these are the same from the center out to the hub. But the projection shows foreshortened views of those spokes. So therefore, we're going to rotate one to the quadrant point, show it, and leave the rest off. And then the last one was the remove, which is where we don't show an object in sufficient detail at the current scale, and so we remove parts of it and show it at an enlarged scale to see the detail. I think if you know all those items right there, you'll do quite well tomorrow. I'll allow an hour and a half, like I said. Um, if you for your tools, you should have your whatever manual tools you need to project views that you use. I also allow you to use any visualization tool that you normally use. So, David, I know you use the computer. Does anybody else draw on the computer for their visualization? Okay, so U6. Okay. You can have them up. Please stick to just CAD and use it for what we're intending it for here to help you visualize. Nothing else, please. Then everybody else is doing something else, maybe sketching or clay or whatever the case might be. Are there any questions about this material? Okay. Um, I do have your test from 132 graded, but we don't really have enough time to go over them, so we'll do that tomorrow. No, we won't. We're going to test tomorrow. <laughs> we'll do it after the test. Maybe I'll hand those out. I will also be putting tomorrow some questions for you for the next chapter we're going to go into. Because we're going to jump into seconds <laughs> after this. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. I, I think that's a pretty thorough review if nobody wants to dive into something a little further. All right, have a ball at the challenge course. You've got enough time to get over there and get your stuff ready. And let's see, Majid, you're staying here, and Missy, are you staying here? Okay, is everybody else going? I believe so. Okay, so Majid and Missy will, will do.